Okay, today is February the 12th, 2007. We are at the Atlanta History Center with Edward Lawrence McNally and his son, Edward Daniel McNally, and his wife, Marcella uh, McNally. And we are conducting an interview for the Veterans History Project. We are delighted to have you here, Mr. McNally. Thank you so much for coming to share your experiences. As I think you know, a copy of this tape will be placed in the Atlanta History Center archives. We're an archival partner with the Library of Congress, and we've conducted about 350 interviews, and uh, send them a copy of your bio biographical form and so forth. Fine. So I'm Francis Westbrook, a staff member here at the History Center. Thank you again. Um, Ed McNally is going to help with this interview. Let's begin by, would you please tell us uh, your birth date and place of birth? I was born July 19, 1923, in Providence, Rhode Island. Good. And um, where did you grow up and go to school? Well, I grew up in New Bedford, Massachusetts, the old whaling city, and went to elementary schools there. Normandin Junior High and New Bedford High School. And when you entered the service, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was attending college on Beacon Hill in Boston on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, when we heard that war was declared. And I immediately came back to New Bedford asked my mother's permission to enlist in the Marines, and she didn't give it to me. So I was watching the newspapers, and a headline appeared, Requirements Reduced for Air Force, Air, not Air Force, Air Corps, a pilot training. And they reduced the requirements from a college education, or at least some college, to a high school diploma, and age 18. So sometime early, possibly February, uh, I enlisted in the Air Force. I was 19 years old, I believe, and uh, since there were no facilities for training Air Force pilots at that time in volume, I was sworn in as a private, and I started receiving uh, $50 a day, once a month. And for the next few months, from about February through July, I waited to be called. I was a private in the Army Air Corps. Great. I've got to ask you, since your mother at first disapproved of your doing that, did she come around? or? How did that work out? That worked out fine. Good. She thought that I'd be much safer as an Air Force pilot than a Marine. Okay. I think your son Ed has some questions he would like to ask you too. So perhaps we'll just um, begin because I know he's heard much of your history before. <clears throat> okay, Dad, let's see. Before we get too far into the actual day-to-day -day details of your training, etc. I'd like you to reminisce and to sort of set the stage of what um, uh, you were living in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Right. Um, your girlfriend, Marcella, our mother, uh, you knew from high school. Right. Um, <clears throat> what? Go back to. Like the right before uh, um, Pearl Harbor, what, what what did you, what were your, what did you know about World War II? It was obviously it was going on in Europe. Was it something that concerned you? Did you talk about it much? Was it in the news all the time? The most important thing, the war, meant to people living in New Bedford, Massachusetts, was a slow march out of the depression because it became the arsenal of democracy. Empty cotton mills became important. We've, in, 
in manufacturing world government supplies. And even the title is Gulf Corporation, which was right across the Akushnet River from where I lived, a little red building. Stop making golf balls and make gas masks. That was an example of what happened leading up to World War II. Did you all feel like there was, a, was there much talk of the, the United States might be involved? Did it, all, did it seem like something very far away? Well, I was involved in a small way in trying to prevent it. Let me tell you what happened. As I was going to school in Boston from September to Pearl Harbor, uh, Charles Lindbergh and several others of the America First Committee had a big rally in one of our theaters, and he was attempting to stop America from entering World War II. And I was right along with him. I didn't want us to enter either. I said, let them fight their own wars. And what about the, the Japan and the Japanese, the, you know, the emperor? Did you, was that on anyone's radar? Did you think you'd, there'd ever be war with Japan? Well, we knew about the so-called rape of Nanking and that the Japanese were heading south, but we didn't feel it. That we didn't know that World War II was beginning for us. So, December 7th, uh, how did you hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Radio, Where were you? On the, I was in uh, a room in Boston near my college, and uh, I happened to be rooming at a minister's parsonage. But we heard about uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. We went back to college and uh, spent some time in the dean's office talking about our future. But not much later, I left college, came back to New Bedford. And I had a job in uh, a, a manufacturing uh, mill before I, went, before I was called into the service. Aerobox, we made capacitors and condensers that were very valuable. And I worked there for about a month. Did you know many other uh, friends or relatives who had enlisted? Everybody was lining up to fight this war. Everybody. There were n everybody that was able would attempt to enlist. Uh, I know your uh, your brother, our uncle Fred enlisted. Was that at the same time as you, before or after? He was a fireman, therefore he did not enlist at the same time I did. Because he wasn't liable to be called and he was a valuable member of the fire department, so it was late in the war that he enlisted. Mm -hmm. He still managed to get his training and become a uh, aerial gunner. It w was um how, how quickly did rationing start or anything like that? I, I can't really remember that particulars, but uh, it wasn't too long before everybody was using rationing stamps to buy tires, automobiles, meat, whatever. When you'd see the news... Oh, by the way, yes. I must make a point. Sure. All during the war, from 1941 to 1945, meat was rationed. Okay. So everybody thought, I can't buy meat, nobody can buy meat. Uh, it's, then the unbelievable thing happened. After all the records were reviewed and the war was over, Americans ate more meat during the war years than they ever ate during the Depression years. There was plenty of meat for the millions of Americans that had never had it before. Uh, 
What about the newsreels you'd see on, on uh, or the news? What was you were hearing? Do you remember hearing accounts yes, live from Europe, yes, from Edward did. R. Murrow or yes, Walter we, Cronkite? We heard Edward R. Murrow, <clears throat> yes, and we watched the news, movie tone news. Everybody uh, went, the movies were our great uh, recreation, so we went to the movies once or twice a week probably and saw the news. We knew what was happening. And were, were people, it excited? Were they scared? Did they think it would be over soon? What was the mood? Uh, we didn't know how long it would last, but we were willing to enlist and fight. All of us. Everybody. What about the women? What about, did you know any women who ended up working in factories? Or, or were they just as patriotic? Are they more concerned? Or Well, uh, I, I went away into the service probably before there was a, a big influx of women into the manufacturing jobs. But in, if, you were to, if you were to talk to your mom or your, your girlfriend at the time, um, did they, were they enthusiastic? Were they supportive? Did they want it to be over as quick as possible? Were they anxious? Did they just not want to talk about it? I don't remember anything like that happening. It was just life as usual. But um, everybody was enthusiastic about trying to win the war. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, okay. So you're enlisted in February of 42. I received $50 a month till July of 42. In July of 42, we assembled in Boston uh, about uh, maybe 50 or 100 of us. And we got on trains heading south. And uh, we were heading for San Antonio, Texas. How long did it take to get there? Well, three or four days, I guess. By train? Yeah, by, all the travel was done by the, all the armed forces by train. And everyone on this train is an enlisted man? Probably. So it's a military train, yeah. basically. And the slogan was, don't drive, take the train. Wheels of steel save rubber. The whole emphasis was on saving rubber because, as you know, the Japanese had captured all the rubber plantations in the South Pacific. Uh huh, uh huh, right. So, when you're on this, this train, did it stop and pick up men in other locations? Or? I can't remember that, but I can remember arriving in San Antonio where. Uh, there were rows of tents, and uh, on this side, uh, this row of tents were men from the south, and this row were men from the north. And I left my tent and proceeded to walk this way, and I heard these shells, Hey, Yankee, who won, the, who won the war? And I said, It was a draw, and I got back to my northern tents. But the, the, they wanted to start an argument about the Civil War. So <laughs> that you said was that funny. to not get in a fight? <laughs> yeah. Right. So did, you, did any friends that you knew leave New Bedford with you? No. So did you make friends right away yeah, that, that so you stayed in touch with during your training? Certainly, certainly, certainly. Many years later, oh, let's say uh, at least 50 years later, I was taking over an office in Washington, D.C. for the Veterans Administration. And I was meeting all my appraisers. And I said, came to one that said, uh, <coughs> what is that name? And I recognized him as a fellow that had been in the service with me. So I, I did keep my friends from the service over the years. Kept some of them we corresponded with, some of them we went to see from time to time. Um, and I know you've always said New Bedford had people from all different nationalities. Oh yeah. yeah. And so now you're you're on this base in San Antonio, and you're seeing uh, where, where people tended to be um, uh, from different countries. Were their parents? Were they were they immigrants? Were there and if you were from German heritage, was that was the was your background a factor when people were all together in uniform? Only 
when the officer in charge was calling Roe and he couldn't pronounce the Polish names or, or whatever. No, every, once you got into uniform, uh, everybody started to kind of mold into one. Mm -hmm. They lost, maybe they lost their accents or, or, or whatever, but despite their backgrounds or their foreign sounding names, we were all one. Now later on, when I tell you about my crew, this will become more important. Uh, so, talk to us about your training from July of 42 till you, uh, you know, you, we know you ship out in May of 44. So there's almost two years of training. Exactly. We, go over that. In, in spite of the fact that I attempted to enlist right after Pearl <clears throat> Harbor, and I did enlist as soon as I could enlist in the Air Force. I didn't go overseas until many, many months later. Okay, so I first started in San Antonio, Texas, in what is in the, what is now the San Antonio Cadet Center. And at that time, it was just top paper shacks, two-story, and a parade ground of stones and sand. And one of our first projects was picking up stones. They lined up 10 trucks and the cadets behind the trucks and our instructions were to pick up a stone and throw it in the truck. And we went all across the parade ground <laughs> throwing stones into the truck. So that was a good way to smooth it out. I lasted, I mean, uh, our training lasted approximately eight weeks. The first four weeks of training in the Cadet Center were somewhat standard training. Uh, exercise, marching, uh, studies, and then the officer in charge called us all to attention at about our fourth week and said from now on, the training has changed. We will try to train like they do at West Point. We will establish a system whereby the upperclassmen are to train the lowerclassmen and give them a hard time. Try to make these men quit because if they quit now, that's better than when they quit later on in the training. So we abused them in every way short of physical uh, instructions. I, I, I remember sitting at the dining room table. I'm from about 5'8", and I had these six-foot guys on both sides of me, and I would tell them, listen, you see that glass? That, see that water glass? I never want to see that water glass less than three-quarters. And they'd say, yes, sir. And we'd put them up against the wall and see if we could keep them there until there was an outline of sweat against the wall. So that was training. And we graduated four <coughs> weeks later as the class of 43E, and we went to Sykeston, Missouri, a little town near the Mississippi River where we started pilot training in a little uh, small steerman, one wing, the cadet sat in the front, the truck pilot sat in the back, and he didn't have any uh, radio or uh, to talk to you, so he had a rubber tube coming from his mouth to your ears, and you could hear him very well. As soon as I took my first flight, I could feel that this was going to make me a little uneasy. And when we started dipping and ac acrobats, I was so sick. All, I, I wanted to throw up, but I couldn't. All I wanted to do was get my feet back on the ground. So after 14 hours of training and after uh, having pneumonia, and being out of training for a week, uh, I didn't make it. I was what we call washed out. 
That ended my pilot time. I went to, uh, we were still considered valuable members of the Air Force, in spite of the fact that we couldn't become pilots. There were other valuable positions to be filled. We were sent to training to become bombardiers. We had some pre-flight training, then we started bombardier training in Big Springs, Texas. Uh, we learned the two bomb sites, and we had uh, uh, something that is quite strange. We we sat in what what appeared to be a large, uh, just a framework on wheels, and it was arranged so that you could work the bomb site, go a couple of inches at a time, you're sitting up about eight feet tall, and down below would be a little map. And if you started to work the bomb site, you could steer this rig right on top of the map and then something would fall. And that would be whether or not you hit the target. And we were on that rig and that bomb site for weeks. And finally, on July, uh, about the 15th of July, 1943, I was commissioned a second lieutenant bombardier with uh, low bars and wings. And I was 19 years old, so I always prided myself on the fact that I was a commissioned officer at the age of 19. About four days later, I was 20. But I still made it. Definitely, definitely. Now, <clears throat> so at this point, the U.S. has been in the war for a year and a half. And there's things going on, in, you know, military actions in North Africa. There's things overseas. Certainly, certainly. Are you hearing about it? Um, by radio, are you going off the base and hearing newsreels? Do they give you reports as part of your training? How, how much are you aware of the rest of what's going on overseas? Well, we, don't, we didn't leave the base at all as cadets. Uh, very, I mean, I can hardly remember being off the base because our training is so strict. But once you're a commissioned officer, you're allowed to leave the base Sundays, for sure. And uh, we, saw the, we saw the newsreels when we went to the movies. I don't remember reading newspapers uh, during my training. We had officers come in and tell us why we fight and wh wh what our enemy will be like. Now, after... Um, getting my wings as a bombardier, I was allowed to come home for about a week, okay. about at which time I became engaged to my high school sweetheart. And uh, the next, my next training was as a navigator, because while it was valuable to be a bombardier, it was more valuable to be a bombardier navigator. These bombardier navigators were given the most dangerous assignments. They were to fly in the new B-29s. A huge plane could go 8,000 miles round trip and carry tremendous loads of bombs. And we all uh, look forward to that assignment. It later turned out that it was a very, very dangerous assignment and I was fortunate not to be a bombardier navigator on a B-29. They were flying from India across over the Himalayas into China to support the Chinese army under Chiang Kai-shek, flying mostly gasoline. It was so dangerous that many, many of them crashed into the mountains during storm. I lost some of my friends who were with me during bombardier training, also during navigation training, succeeded in getting their navigation wings, flying the B-29s, and crashing to their death. 
Now, I could handle some navigation uh, requirements to do what they call, uh, cele I couldn't do celestial navigation, but I could handle the navigation that depended upon noting special sites on the ground, the navigation that depended upon knowing your heading, your airspeed, the wind, and so forth. But when I reached Celestial, which required a, a book about the size of a phone book, and had to read the stars and go into the books, and it, it took a special mind, a, 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 an accountant's mind, and I wasn't equal to it. So, uh, I was ready to go overseas as a bombardier. Before we take you overseas, um, when, you, when you had that time uh, at home briefly, and when you, first of all, how often would you hear from Marcella? How often would you get letters, or were we ever able to make a phone call of any kind? I don't recall making phone calls, but I got a letter about once a day. Oh my goodness. And I wrote one about once a night. That's how I kept my contact. I didn't want it to meet anybody else because they were a lot of guys who didn't get in for one reason or another. And what would she talk about in terms of what was going on in New Orleans, uh, New Bedford? Was, well, if they weren't love letters, they were very affectionate letters. Uh -huh. And I don't remember her talk, <laughs> talking about. much about uh, current events. I understand, certainly. Uh, but when you got back and you texted in with family and friends, did, had America changed at all? Did it seem different now that you'd sort of been off on your own for a while and now you're back home? Mm -hmm. where, where, by that time, I mean, did you have gold star mothers who had lost yes, some children? Yes, yes, some? yes. My mother was a blue star mother with two stars. My brother Me meaning my she had two sons in the service. In the service. But not, not killed. Uh, did you, um, so let's, you, you got engaged, I, re I remember hearing that was December of 43, and then you, f you ended up going to um, uh, Salt Lake City briefly. Yes, I went to Salt Lake City, I met my crew B, in a uh, B-24 Liberator bomber, and I learned how to fire a pistol, a rifle, and a submachine gun on the coldest day of my life. I went out to the plains, not too far from the Salt Lake and Salt Lake City in the middle of winter, the wind rushing across. That's something I'll never forget. Just let's pause here just to see a picture of B-24 okay. Liberator. Um, where, where would you have been on a mission? Where would you well, have been on a plane? Well, I make a point to say that we all clamor into the plane through the Bombay doors when they're open. The pilot and co-pilot go to their places. Pilot on the left, co-pilot on the right. Uh, the, there's a, a sergeant who's a flight engineer. He goes up on the flight deck with them. The radio man goes to his radio the navigator to his navigation desk. Uh, my turret, nose turret gunner and the bombardier stay in this flight deck until the plane is well in the air and on the way. Meanwhile, uh, three gunners have entered to the waist, and that is the tail turret, and the belly turret, and one of the waist guns. And uh, that, that, that cons that's the crew of 10. During uh, attacks by enemy aircraft, the flight engineer takes this turret and the radio man goes to the waist. That's uh, 10 men trying to fight off enemy fighters. As you know, dear son, we were shot down by enemy fighters. We're gonna we're gonna get to that, um, but let's let's keep the sequence going here a little bit further, um, because before you leave, uh, you feel you've got to go ahead and get married. That's right. So tell me about when you t you asked uh, mom, your your fiance at this point, to uh, to when you got engaged, you didn't know when you'd be married exactly. 
Um, so tell me about when you told her we need to go ahead well, and get married. Uh, we, I was established in uh, uh, Colorado Springs on the conditions which if, if we were married we could be happy. And it was uh, a little cabin and next door would, was my co-pilot and next to him was my pilot. And one of, they had, one of them had a, an automobile. So I sent her a telegram insisting that she come to Colorado Springs and marry me. She had never left home before. She was only 18. I didn't even, I wasn't sure that her parents would give her permission, but she did. All by herself, she got on a train, traveled three quarters of the way across the country to marry a man that she had seen for a total of two weeks in the previous almost two years. It was madness. But we were married, we're still married, and there she is. Amen. Still supporting me. <laughs> uh, so, tell us about just, um, you, just a little bit, you know, you, you had to, did you get to have a honeymoon of any kind? Well, sure. Uh, we, we were very, very happy. Uh, we uh, would go to the officers club, we formed a little group, uh, we drank and laughed and danced together. We went to the Garden of the Gods in Colorado Springs where we had a terrible experience on two horses. Oh, we'll skip that. <laughs> we'll skip that for time. So anyway, we know no one was injured. Uh, but anyway, she gets to stay for a couple months with you as your well, wife. it's more than a couple. How long before? Because this is, I know your, your wedding is March 11th, 44. You ship out May 7th, 44. Yeah. So there you go. That final spring. Was that, you saying that was a happy time? It wasn't, yeah. you weren't, there wasn't a moment when you got really anxious? No. Because um, by this point, you're hearing about the yeah, casualties, yeah, etc. Uh, What's the mood among the men? Everyone's super confident, or exactly? Yes, indeed. Never worried a minute. Are you are you restless to go, or do you want to no, stay no, no. as long as you can? Well, well, we're perfectly willing to let things uh, go forward as they as they will. Uh -huh. We knew that the we had to leave to go overseas, but uh, we weren't particularly anxious about it. And now I'll tell you about our trip overseas. Yes. We, uh, we, we flew out of Colorado Springs in an old bomber. We landed somewhere in, uh, I guess it was South Dakota, to pick up a brand new one, shiny new bomber. And we flew down to uh, Florida and there, we had an interesting experience. They came to our new bomber and pitched in uh, mail, cases and bundles of mail, and they said to me, here, take this gun, and they strapped on a new pistol, and they said, you protect the mail. If anybody tries to steal it, shoot them. You, the only one on the plane yeah, with that they responsibility. Yeah, that's the bomb, one of the bombardier's jobs, was protecting those bales of mail. We flew uh, to uh, the Ca Caribbean island, Barrinkin Field, Puerto Rico, then down to British Guiana, into uh, Brazil, and finally get, got ready for our trip across the Atlantic, which would be approximately uh, an 11-hour flight. No, we didn't stop at any islands. We flew all the way to uh, Africa. Was that fun? Was that scary? Was that cold? Well, we were flying for 11 hours. We had never flown in a plane that long before. I must say the command pilot, Jim Jatho, uh, played a little trick on the navigator. <laughs> Ted Bell from the from University of Illinois was the navigator, and he was worried. He was studying his tables, trying to shoot the sun and uh, 
we were saying, Ted, get us there. We don't want to hit the jungle. We want to land near the base. So, and later on, it was, oh yeah, we pulled in to Africa. We landed exactly right at our base. And later on, the pilot told us he had picked up the radio signal 500 miles away. <laughs> and he hones in on the radio signal right into the base. Couldn't have got lost. No, he couldn't have gotten lost at all. And that's and Dakar? Uh, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it was Dakar. And uh, as, he tax as he taxied his, ta uh, his plane to a spot, we saw the first sign of Africa. A, uh, an African dressed in some kind of a loincloth had a long stick in his hand and a piece of paper on the stick. And he held it up, and the pilot took it from the window and read his instructions on what, how to taxi and when to stop so we could stay overnight. We stayed overnight in Dakar, surrounded by mosquito netting so we wouldn't get uh, malaria. Then we went up the coast of Africa, and I, I was studying the maps and I saw a little town called Tindouf, and I said, hey, fellas, look, there's Tindouf. That was the scene of the famous uh, British novel about uh, musketeers uh, in, a, in a British, I mean, French foreign, foreign legion. Legion, of course, right? yes, yes. Uh, so, but your final destination is in Europe, where? It's Pantalea, a little tiny farming <clears throat> village near Foggia in Italy. And the wheat fields of Italy are, by that time, there's wheat waving there. In, in order to form an army air base, uh, an air force air base, is a simple, pro, uh, simple job. <clears throat> they take um, a bulldozer and they smooth out an area about 5,000 feet long in the wheat fields. And then they take interlocking pieces of metal about the size of, of your, your thumb and it, form, and it, it forms a, 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 a flat landing field. All it is is inter interlocking metal strips, which you can roll up like a carpet. And that was our air base. How did we live? Uh, somebody told us to go and stand there, and a guy came by in a truck and threw out a tent. He said, there's where you're going to live. Set it up. However, we, nobody knew how to set up a, a tent. And we tried it in several ways, and finally I stood with my foot and I said, here, put it there, and then push it up. It'll be in the middle. So we put the tin up, and we started to live. So the bet was, are we going to eat out of mess kits, or are we going to eat out of, are we going to a mess hall? And it ended up that we had a mess hall, and we ate out of metal containers, but that was it. And we used to have to get up before dawn, go to uh, a briefing, learn where our next target was, plane would get ready to take off, and we would fly in the dark, form up for our bomb mission. Now it took you almost a month to get from Colorado Springs to, to Italy, to your base, uh, and I know uh, for, for the record here that you were on the same base uh, with um, George McGovern, senator from South Dakota, was the presidential candidate in 1972. You, you never remember meeting him, though. No, no, he, he flew much later than I did. Uh -huh. but, did uh, how I, big was the base? How many people stationed there? Uh, it's about, we had about 24 planes. <clears throat> Each one had 10 men. And we had, uh, I'd say, um, probably another 30 administrators of one way or another one kind or another. But I'll tell you something interesting about our flight as we flew into, uh, he heading toward Italy, it was D-Day, 6th okay. of June. Okay. So we landed in our base sometime shortly after D-Day. 
And now, were you aware of the invasion? Had you heard oh, it was yes, going to happen? Yes, we knew it was the invasion. We could see activity in the Mediterranean. So. And what was the what was the mood around that? Was that a, incredibly exciting? It's something that people have been looking forward to for a long time. Certainly, certainly, certainly. We knew that D-Day was coming, and we were glad to be there to take part in it. Now, at this point, the war is it's. We're talking 44. We've been on for two and a half years. But um, what was? Did you by this time know anyone who'd been captured or killed? And no. were you hearing stories from your I'm fellow sure. officers about that? I mean, what, how, what were you hearing about from the front line? Anything? I'm sure. Uh, <clears throat> I, I want to describe every day in the local paper there would be an account of those who were killed. So we knew when one of our uh, acquaintances ha had been killed, if, if you read the <coughs> local paper, but of course we in the service didn't know that. I see. And how many of the people on your bomb, on uh, your ship, oops, your crew, I'm sorry, can you name? How many of those names oh, do you remember? I could rattle them right Let's hear them right now. Okay. I already said it. Did well, now, okay, you want me to do it again? Let's give them that on. Okay. Jay Thoencroft were the pilot and co-pilot. And the interesting thing about Jay Thoencroft is this, they're only second generation Germans, both about six feet tall, blonde hair, blue eyes. They were just Nordic from the start, and they were just as the most patriotic guys you could imagine. My turret gunner was Toomey. He was an Irishman from Boston. The flight engineer was Jay Taylor Fish, and uh, he was, well, he was something special. The radio man uh, was about 35, he was McGill, he was married, and the, as, the navigator was Bell from the University of Illinois. The turret gunner was Maxon, William F. Maxon, Jr. The waist gunner was Robert Speed. Uh, the belly gunner was Selick, C-E-L-U-C-K. Uh -huh. And you, you started flying. How quick did you get up in the air? How soon did they send you on a mission? Well, nobody went on a mission. Uh, no, the full crew and, oh, by the way, I'll tell you what happened to our plane. As soon as we landed, he took it away from us. Uh -huh. It was new. They gave it to a, an office, high-ranking officer. We got a kind of a beat-up plane. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the way it goes. Uh, everybody flew as an observer on somebody else's plane to see what it was like to go on a mission. Shall I tell you sure. about what happened on, when I flew? Yes. Uh, I, was a, I flew as an observer of a bombardier. Uh, of the bomb run, and uh, I had never been in combat before, I had never been shot at by anti-aircraft guns, I had no idea what it be, would be like, but as we approached the target, we could see a solid gray cloud. That was anti-aircraft fire going off. Each anti-aircraft battery consisted of four guns shooting four shots at a time, and they were timed to explode at the height, however we, we were flying, 20,000 feet, 18,500, they would set their uh, explosive charges. So the bombardier that I was supposed to be observing and studying his actions so I could see what to do during an actual flight. He fell down on the floor, assumed the fetal yeah. position, and took out his Bible and started to read his Bible. And that was all he did to, during the entire mission. And uh, I, I wonder what happened to the man. I never, I never heard any more about it. I was in combat for such a short time that I didn't get to know anybody else in any of the crews. Uh -huh. But you're saying on that particular mission you guys were attacked, you were shot. Uh -oh. on, on almost every mission 
we faced anti-aircraft fire because the Germans had an unlimited supply of anti-aircraft guns. And how did you, I've heard that it was hard to actually hear outside the plane, so how did you know there was fire coming? Could you see it? Could you feel it hit the plane? What happened? Well, when it hits the plane, it seems like that somebody's throwing a bunch of pebbles at you. Yeah, you can feel that. Does, do these, does the flak ever go through the plane? Um, does anyone ever get injured in a plane, other than that the plane completely explodes? There's an account of the death of a co-pilot, which is horrible. Only one piece of flak goes through the window of the plane, the size of your thumbnail, got him right in the neck, right in the juggler, and he died. But that's an example of what flak can do. It's, that's the German name for anti-aircraft fire, and those, those uh, anti-aircraft shells explode and they send flak in every different direction. And so where, what are your targets? Where are you going? Where are you dropping your bombs? Oh my goodness. We're dropping them on uh, aircraft factories, uh, railroad junctions, oil um, fields, oil tanks, that sort of thing. I can't remember all the names, but I remember some of them. Name the ones you can recall. Gosh, the one that I can recall with somewhat of a grin is whenever I see a travel a movie about uh, Venice, I say we bombed Venice. Venice. Beautiful as it is, they had oil tanks, and that was it. We would go and head for Venice. That was what we call a milk run. A milk run is a short flight, uh, not too much, uh, uh, not too much opposition, and an easy flight back. Got credit for one. But when you went to Munich. Vienna or the Ploiesti de oil fields, that was worth two. It was worth a double mission. Um, would you, uh, <laughs> by the way, we've got this picture in front oh, yeah. of you. Just just tell us uh, when this was taken, if you can remember, oh, and gosh. what you're wearing. Um. Uh, that, that was within a couple of months or so of my commission. Okay. And uh, that's probably a new uniform, but if you take, there's something called a grommet, which is a round hoop-like piece of metal, which the men of all other army positions have to keep in their hat, but we Air Force officers took it out right away, <laughs> bent the hat so that it tried to resemble a 50-mission crush. Ah. <laughs> what you cause, the mine was almost new. I only had a total of 16 missions, and uh, that was probably no more than eight real, no, probably no more than 12 real missions. But we had a job to do. We were like, um, we just came in replacements. If you had 24 planes in a squadron, during the war, the, squ the entire squadron would be wiped out. By that I mean we would lose 24 planes. Some of them would last the full mission, but the replacement crews would come in. So, uh when you're in Italy for this month, do you ever get off that base? Do you ever see any countryside or village? Do you ever meet any, any Italians, any contact? By this time, obviously, the, the Allies have conquered Italy, of course. I, I met a famous Italian. Now, if I can remember my facts, you'll find them amusing. Uh, as I was flying over to Italy, we stopped at various 
air bases along the way, and I went into an officer's club and I picked up a copy of a magazine called the, uh, let's see, what was the name of that magazine? Well, forget the name of the magazine, but I, this is the article, the name will come to me. The article is called Along the Via Dante, and it's a story of an Italian philosopher who preached against the war, and uh, he lived in retirement on the Via Dante in the little town of Foggia. So I kept my copy, and on the first time I was allowed to go to Foggia, I went right to his house on the Via Dante. I rang the bell, I got in, I, I was introduced to him. I mean, I shook hands and I told him that I had a copy of a, a magazine in English which contained an article all about him. And he said, oh, I have the Italian uh, copy, but I have never seen the English one. And I appreciate it very much. Now, before this interview is over, I'll remember his name okay. and what he's famous for, but you know how those, <coughs> you forget him for the minute. You, so, uh, also, when yes. I'm talking about planes and anti-aircraft fire, it's tough for me to remember a philosopher's name. Of, right course, of course, of course. But I was the only American that ever visited a philosopher <laughs> on his trip to, to probably, uh, probably. Uh, for, for rest and rehab. We Did usually, you? if you stayed long <clears throat> enough, you would go to, uh, the, 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 I, I'll tell you sure, later. Sure, It's amazing now, how I'm forgetting these things. Well, you're remembering a lot, believe me. You, you know, we, we hear that uh, men stationed in different places, particularly uh, Americans stationed in England, for instance, ended up uh, meeting British girls, marrying British girls, the single guys. Obviously, you're, you're, you're happily married. You've only been married at this point That's for a few months. That's why I went to see the philosophy. Sure. <laughs> and so, <laughs> What, did that? Did well, you know of that? You did you know, know single you guys know who what, met if, European girls? If you want to know what happened, think of Catch-22. Uh -huh. That's the story of the flyers in Italy, what they did. Uh, I No, I don't know of any Americans who married Italian girls. Uh -huh. No, because remember, six weeks. Right, not much time. So you're, let's, let's, Talk quickly then about your this last flight. Do you remember where no, you were that last mission? Uh, no, don't you want to talk about the next to the last? Yes, actually we do, okay. we should. In fact, just so you know, we're going to conclude this tape, take a break, and then we'll start another one okay. with that. So we'll, we can wrap up with this mission or the last mission. All right, well, I'd rather talk about the last one. Well, we've got time to talk about the one before. Because that's going to relate to this oh, yeah. DFC conversation, right? Like. Uh, we are going to. Uh, oh, when we when we sit down in the briefing tent, and the intelligence officer removes uh, something that covers the map, and he says, "We're going," and he's with his pointer. Sometimes it's easy. We're going to Venice. And everybody laughs. But when he says we're going up the Ploiesti oil fields in Hungary, in Ru Romania, Romania, very far away, at the very end of our range, we cannot make a flight much further than that because it takes about five hours to get to Ploiesti. You know, those big lumbering planes flew in combat at about 165 or 170 miles an hour. So it took us about over five hours to get there, drop our bombs, and five hours to come back. That's a total of 10 hours. It only took 11 hours to fly from South America to Africa. So those, those missions were really deadly. It takes so long and there's so much danger along the way. So uh, we, 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 fought, well, we start off uh, before, di before dawn and we fly in, start off at night and, and it's dark. And then as it, the dawn comes up, 
we start groups, squadrons and groups from all over Italy start forming until finally on a full mission you can see nothing but silver planes as far as your eye can see. Wow. It's so you're planes. looking at hundreds of planes. Yeah, yeah. hundreds. Yeah. And uh, it's a beautiful sight. And we had such a flight into Ploesti, Romania, on the 15th of July, 1944. Uh, I remember that there was so much anti-aircraft fire that when I went to arm the bomb load, uh, we were already being, our plane was already shifting because of the of impact. Now, in order to bomb arm the bombs, you have to walk along an eight-inch girder and reach up and pull out a little piece of wire and there's a, a little propeller on the bomb. And if you, uh, if you leave that wire in, the bomb won't explode. So each uh, uh, bomb must be armed by pulling a wire. Of course, you've got things to grab on. And so I armed all the bombs, went down to the bomb site, and it, the, the anti-aircraft fire got, got worse. And we could hear the word, we've been hit by anti-aircraft fire. The left engine is gone. We're flying on three engines. Well, we dropped the bombs, and then we tried to turn with our group and fly with them, and we started to go lower and lower. We lost altitude. We lost speed. And you could see the, all those silver planes. They disappeared. We were all alone somewhere in Romania, we did, and we had the problem of getting back. But we did something that every pilot and co-pilot loved to do. We hit the deck. We were flying at treetop level. Man. We had a, the navigator had to figure out a heading. The rest of us watched as we flew in. We were, we were in real trouble. But when we reached the Adriatic Sea, the radio man picked up a signal from our base, and pilot and co-pilot flew it in on three engines safely. He saved a crew and a plane to fly again. Yeah. And on that note, we're going to conclude okay. this half of our story. Thank you very much. Are we, are we there? How about that? At an exciting juncture. So that way you get to... Was that the 60 minutes? Yeah. Now we won't, we won't necessarily go 60 no. the next time. Because we're going to talk about the last mission, the prison camp, and coming home. And that'll be pretty much it. That's great. This is fascinating. I wanted to fast forward <coughs> this so that when we start again, we'll, we'll start at the very beginning. See, this is an hour tape, so we came out, you know, both of them just right. Good. I'm going to walk over to the other building and get another tape. And so you all can go to the restroom or Have whatever you want to do. One thing now, that do you need? I've got a, um, I think in the car, I might have a granola bar, but. Well, in the car, we. Should we have anything? I, I don't want anything. I don't need anything. Okay, good. I would like to ask at some point, I don't know if all the crew members are written down somewhere, mm. but I, are they? Because I'd like to get those names spelled right. And I tried to jot down some notes, but. Unless they're written oh, down it, somewhere. It, oh, you need it in writing? Well, if you want to check the spellings of various names, unless you all want to take a bathroom break, that'll be something That's very, something you very, can do very while, helpful. While you're probably, obviously. Honey, I can make you a hot chocolate. Yeah, there's hot oh, chocolate. Who do that? Yeah. yeah. Let me get a That'd hot chocolate. Thing. Who else? Oh, there's coffee too. Hot chocolate, coffee, let me, or let me tea. Yeah. Well, do whatever I you can do to, do to make it easy yeah. to go without stopping when we start again. Because you're doing That's great. You're doing great. It's you're doing great. You're great. It's fascinating. Would you like a hot chocolate? And no, you're making it easy for all of us. It, <laughs> yeah, this is and we're going to make copies of this and send it to everybody in the family. Mike and Terry and everyone will enjoy this. <clears throat> I'm going to go to the bathroom. Keep.
Oh, it's McGill. Not McGill. McGill.